was just going to comment that I also recall at this table, we, we had discussed um, people working it through the night and as we were trying to encourage residential and, and uh, in the downtown. Uh, that was one of the concerns that we had, that we did want people, you know, machinery to be working through the night, and that would extend the, the length of time. Bright lights, riveting, mm -hmm. bad hotels. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa. So I just have one question of clarification and then a question about finances. So when you say that the bridge, if we make it too heavy, it won't lift, basically, right? It won't lift easily. So but can the... Will the load rating, so if we're making a, si a building that will, or a bridge rather, that will, is a seismic lifeline, right? Or that's the standard of building. So presumably really, really heavy equipment can drive across it. Is that correct? I don't think that's the definition of a lifeline bridge. Okay. The definition of a lifeline bridge is that under a moderate earthquake, there is no damage. Mm -hmm. Under a slightly bigger earthquake, you can get emergency vehicles across it. And under a massive earthquake, you don't have a collapse. Right. So the the whole question then of I'm not talking about a rail bridge. I'm just talking about, and I, I understand that there are different design codes, and that was actually helpful because I didn't know that there's one for road run for rail. Um, but so is the design that's being undertaken now? Does it necessarily preclude the option of ever having streetcars or light rail or something go ep go across that bridge? That I just. Yeah, and, and I, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Okay, so does that and mean the lower... But I just yeah. want to just wanna say yeah, that, that, the, that the design really depends on the technology. Mm -hmm. So if you're designing, for example, for SkyTrain, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's what you're going to have, but if you're designing for SkyTrain, the stiffness of the bridge becomes much more important than its strength so that you can't have undue deflections because that'll bugger up the way the train runs across it. Mm -hmm. If you're designing for a freight train, then strength becomes the overwhelming requirement. And if you're designing for like a commuter train like that's out there right now, that's essentially a similar design as a freight train. Mm -hmm. If you're designing for a streetcar, I have to say that I don't know the answer to your question. And um, it's something that, you know, that you'd have to look at it's a stiffness issue, it's a strength issue. There's all kinds of stuff that you have to start investigating with that. The one thing that does come to my mind is with a streetcar, they typically run on overhead trolleys, mm -hmm. and with a movable bridge, that is very difficult to achieve because your bridge opens, and therefore, what do you do with your electric cables? Do you work, uh, do you work uh, there was yeah, also some other. And through your worship, there was some other considerations that I wouldn't mind Mr. Lai uh, expressing regarding whether or not, uh, whether you put a streetcar on this uh, bridge or not that's designed for three lanes of travel. There's a whole host of implications that were outlined in his recent memo that uh, is identified what those issues were. So, Mr. Lai, if you don't mind just sharing that with council for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, through the mayor, in terms of uh, putting a streetcar or rail or anything on the new bridge within the existing or within the, the three lanes that are to be provided, uh, you're taking up capacity for, for road traffic. Uh, there are certain um, concerns that have been identified. That means uh, that on the downtown side, uh, if, if, uh, uh, if capacity is, uh, is reduced, there's more congestion uh, on the downtown side. Uh, we start affecting uh, intersections uh, further back from the harbor further into the downtown. Uh, in terms of queuing. Uh, emergency responders have previously indicated to us uh, that they would be uh, very concerned about a reduction in capacity or lane capacity uh, on the bridge because it makes it more difficult uh, for them to, uh, to respond. It takes more time, uh, et cetera. And, and Your Worship, and the last point is that the rail that's on there today is within a five meter corridor. The lane widths that are being built today are three meters, and that's to be commensurate with the travel speeds that are being proposed along this corridor, which are to be lower traffic speeds. So to put in that type of technology, you have to keep the width of that corridor in, in the, into consideration because you're putting now cyclists adjacent to that type of technology or that rail that you're being proposed, which is a, which is a consideration, and then also with the traffic that's traveling this line. Just 
follow up. Uh, so when we had a governance um, uh, expert come in, and she was in my mind really helpful, Liz Watson, and we had a really great session here. And I asked the question, and I had the Johnson Street Bridge in mind in part when I did, are we to be focused as a council on the present or the future? And without hesitation, she said, on the future. So I'm certainly not suggesting putting rail on the bridge, streetcar on the bridge, anything like that on the bridge now. What I'm wanting to do, and what I feel like it's my responsibility to do, is in 50 years, when there's only two cars going across the bridge every day, and everyone's taking rail because that's the way of the future, I want the bridge that we build to at least have that capacity for the future. That's, that is what I want to know that we can do. Mm -hmm. that, I think, through your worship, that's the reason for maintaining this land and not developing the S curve land. And also, to maintain worship, that ability. And also, you don't know the technology of 50 mm -hmm. years exactly. and what may be proposed, and there may be lighter weight technology mm -hmm. that is comparable. Mm -hmm. that is, that's, that's part of the. Uh, the assessment you can you only can guess today what we'll have one in the future and so to design something for now is you're being put in uh, additional costs that you may not be able to realize or materialize down the road because you don't know the technology that's going to be uh, pre preferred down the road by whoever the local authority is that manages that entity and, and that's a, a consideration and also in 50 years keep in mind design codes change as people learn more design codes do do get upgraded and so you have to keep that into consideration what you design for today what you expect for 50 years from now will it even meet that requirement for the future there's a lot of risk and there's a lot of guessing in, in that scenario that we need to be mindful of and that's why we're the strategy that's been proposed to date and what's been recommended by the consulting team is preserve the corridor for the future Well, actually, just kind of picking up on the last two speakers, um, <laughs> I would actually spin it a little bit differently on its head. And that is to say, if we're designing a bridge right now, which is, in theory, reflecting the best industry standard for our existing technology, that does not, from what I'm hearing, preclude the opportunity for 50 or 60 years from now when only Jeff is still on council, <laughs> that that particular council couldn't say, Okay, we don't want three lanes for cars, and we don't want all of these lovely accoutrements for walkers and bicycles. What we really want is we want a bridge that will have only public transit, whatever that looks like in 2060 or 2070. And if this industry standard now is sufficient to carry the types of loads that people are discussing, I don't see that that option is precluded. I can't imagine what that looks like in mm -hmm. 50 years, and I can't imagine what I would design to try and do something that's 50 years appropriate. But what I'm hearing is that if the technology has changed so dramatically that you have extraordinary lightweight capacities for transportation at that point, this bridge might be able to carry it if you decide, whoever's here at that point, that you don't want cars running on it. So I'm actually listening to this from a different perspective and going, maybe. Right now, we want to put cars and trucks on this and people in wheelchairs and bicycles and walkers and whatnot. But if a future council says, you know, actually, what we really want here is some completely different type of technology, you have a fairly extraordinary capacity for weight and stiffness and a variety of other things that may, in fact, support a future technology of which we're currently unaware. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually listening to the engineering comments and thinking, well, it's kind of hopeful because I don't hear a door closing. I hear a door remaining open to something that I'm not aware of at this point. And so that gives me a certain amount of comfort. I actually had a completely different question, and I, I know the answer to this, but I wouldn't mind some clarification and just reminder. And I wondered if uh, Mr. Lai or anyone else could just remind me about the rationale behind straightening out the S-curve. I recall it being primarily around safety issues, but could you just refresh my memory on that? Uh, through the mayor, in terms of the S-curve, uh, what we had identified uh, over a five-year period between 2003 and 2008, uh, there were over uh, 210 crash incidents uh, along the, uh, this portion uh, of the corridor. Um, so safety, uh, yes, uh, is, is an issue. That's one of the reasons why the uh, concrete uh, Jersey barrier uh, is, uh, is installed, is in place there today uh, to prevent head-on um, head -on, uh, collision. Uh, but even, even so, with that there today, uh, there are uh, still crash incidents uh, that do occur. So safety was, uh, was definitely an issue. And in terms of uh, building a new bridge, um, we had to go north of the existing bridge in order to 
uh, ensure that we could maintain traffic over the crossing without uh, disrupting it. Because the economic impact assessment that was done as part of the technical work back in uh, 2010 uh, identified that if we closed this crossing uh, to traffic in, in order to either rehabilitate uh, the existing bridge or to build a new bridge exactly in its place would be an impact of, a, of at least $13 million a year to the downtown, uh, which, uh, which is a significant impact. And, and I believe at the time, uh, we also had to be mindful of um, a court issue uh, at, at the time, and that was the, uh, the uh, uh, Hayes, uh, Hayes decision or the, the related to the Canada lot uh, that was constructed along Canby Street uh, on the lower mainland. Uh, so, um, you know, the, at that point in time, we felt our hands were, in, in a sense, tied so that we're not affecting downtown, we're not opening the door for um, a, a, a lawsuit or legal action as a, as a result of that. Was there a decision um, on the Canby Street, as the, the court said, if you have two options before you and you take the lesser costing option, but it impacts on someone, uh, then you have to pay those costs. And which time I think they, they had to pay someone $500,000 or more. <coughs> At that time, council said, we need to be aware of that. We have this cost, uh, this economic impact study that essentially says minimum $13 million a year. Three years, you're looking at 45 to $50 million. So that we, you know, one of the things we had to weigh between the replacement and the new option was, you know, there may be an extra $50 million cost associated with the, the replacement issue. In the end, part of what council said is, whether it's appealed or not, and it was successfully appealed, um, would you still want to morally cause $60 million worth of economic damage to your downtown? And so those are part of the, it was just one of the things that we weighed as we, we looked at those decisions. But it, was, it was an interesting decision that still continuing to plays in people's minds. Try. And just to add to that, uh, in the discussions we had there is that uh, even taking the economic impact, if we look at the big businesses that may be able to survive, the small businesses we recognize would would not, and, and of course the loss of um, the labor force, the people that are having to be, you know, uh, fired or, or laid off because of that. Um, that was one of the decisions we had to make at the time. The one piece I want to get into is interesting because I had a conversation uh, last night, frankly, uh, you know, just come back and forth talking about someone about the benefits or non-benefits of rail, um, and the person was quite adamant that, that rail should be included at this time. And then in the end, I said, like worst case scenario, you know, what happens is in the future our feds, our province, the region jumps in and says we want to do this, uh, that the rail would stop if we didn't want to spend the extra money to bring it across. You would have to get off on that side of the Johnson Bridge Street Bridge and, and walk over and then connect into the street line or downtown bus or that sort of thing. Um, and we laughed and I went and paced it out. And, and I get off at when it snows because I usually my way to ride my bike. But I get off three quarters of the way up uh, this block here on, on, on uh, Pandora. It is a longer walk from that bus stop to City Hall than it is across to go get off on that side of the Johnson Street Bridge and just hook into the line. So those are, again, you know, part of those considerations. How much money and how much damage and how much do you want to do when in the worst case scenario, people have to walk 50 meters to connect with the next line. So those are some of the considerations, but ultimately uh, we have those larger considerations about turning it back uh, if, if that's what the council will, but uh, perhaps we'll get another discussion in a bit. Lisa? So follow up to my last question and then a new question about financing. Um, I am also, like Councillor, also hopeful. So you're not saying then that the bridge couldn't possibly accommodate some kind of streetcar technology other than the overhead wire thing, which I understand is an issue in the future. We, you don't know at this, or do you know at this point what the bridge can hold? I, you know, I don't know how to answer that, honestly, because I, I can't tell what's going to happen in the future. I, I don't know. Okay. So, okay, ask it, and I'll ask it another way. Does the load rating of the current bridge allow a streetcar to drive across it? Get, I know that it's not designed yeah. for rail, but... I've never checked that. So could, you, could we check that? But you have to realize it's, it's not when the bridge is down that's your critical part, right? Yeah. It's when that bridge lifts. Uh -huh. And what you're trying to do is keep that as light, light as, as possible. possible. Yep. So it's not the car, but it's the rails. Mm -hmm. If you start accommodating rails on that deck, that's not designed. So that's where we have to go back to square one. Okay. So one would assume whether it's a streetcar, LRT, whatever, you need those rails, mm -hmm. and that's not what's accounted for. Okay. So in the future, you have a thing that runs on the rail, and the, the little wheels pop up, and you drive across yeah. the bridge? No big deal, right? Okay. No big deal. Great. So can I ask a... Although it might be a big deal in the width. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, I have another question. Now, do we need to, this is going to sound funny, do we actually have to borrow $49.2 million? Like up to. Up to. Up okay, to. great. So then m my question is, are we uh, actively pursuing other sources of funding, not for rail, but other sources of funding to bring down the borrowing costs? We've got a few years to work on that, so is that something that's in the pipes? Through your worship, we have um, applied for everything, including, as you know, <laughs> Um, through the um, CMHC to lower, you know, the cost of borrowing, et cetera, et cetera. We, anything that's out there, we apply. Great. And so we're not ineligible to do that once the construction no. starts? The, the limit for uh, federal funding is it can't be more than 50% of the project. Um, so okay. that's the outside of it. Yeah, and just something else. Still be willing to take money from the province. <laughs> we have gone back to the province yeah. several times. Something uh, that you pointed out that I think is quite compelling, and I don't know if this is in terms of thinking about funding applications, 50% of the trips, roughly 50% of the trips, let's say 45% of the trips across the bridge every day are alternative transportation, biking and walking. So maybe there's some rich American foundation that funds the same. Well, I don't know, I'm just thinking a little bit about... It. Yeah. We applied for the bike with the province, yes. you know, for help with, with the cost of uh, the bike lane they're promoting healthy healthy living and healthy yeah. transportation. Like anything, like a million dollars hill and here, a million dollars there. I mean, I know that's a lot of work. I'm not seriously suggesting that, but anything that we can do to lower the borrowing costs, because you said to me, Dale, in our meeting, and I thought this was true, people are going to come from all over the world to see this beautiful bridge, but I want them to come and see the bridge and also to see a thriving downtown, not a downtown where all the businesses are closed because property taxes are so high because small business owners can't. Now, that's a bit dramatic, but it's, it's an and. That's all for now. Any old councils with new voices that want to jump in at this time? <laughs> Coleman, Madoff, at this time. Uh, ben? Okay, um, if I have not done with the rail question, but before we entertain that, I think if there was a bona fide desire to reduce the borrowing costs, council would open up the project scope to opt for a simpler design using existing technology, because the fact is by making the decision to have an iconic bridge, we're adding Again, I'm not an engineer, but maybe 20 or 30 million dollars to the cost. Like, is there any substance to that? Our point was, is we always said, we want a bridge that's iconic that people come and see. We didn't want a bridge that was going to cost a bazillion dollars just because it looked nice. That was one of the big points that, that we really pushed. Well, so would there be savings with a simpler design in your professional view? The, the, um, there's a premium you pay for an architectural decision. Is it substantial or is it... The, and I, it's going to be a kind of a weasley answer. Sorry. No problem. Uh, every bridge is different because it's a w it's a one-off. Unless you design two bridges to compare the costs, it's a very difficult question to answer. Okay. Um, just on the bridge question, I think we're not here to engage in science fiction. And regardless of where science is going to be in 2070. I think it's more a near-term question that will we will there be a partner or partners for operating rail, and a light rail train from Duncan and Langford into the downtown by 2019 or theoretically by 2015 and we shift gears. Um, so I think it's, I'm, I'm glad Mr. Kalnicek's final remark, I'm glad it was consistent with what Mr. Lai reported in December 15, 2011, which said a different design would be acquired to accommodate rail on the bridge now or in the future. And so I think we should be clear that our professional advice is that the current design being contemplated will not accommodate rail. So this recent sci-fi speculation that they'll have, I don't know, back to the future-esque cars. So I think at some point I do intend to move a motion that uh, we amend the charter to accommodate rail and to see where our council is on that question. I just found that statement extremely puzzling and perhaps unintentionally misleading because the whole thrust behind this design was to ensure that rail could be accommodated in the future. So the bridge design, as presented, can accommodate rail in the future and is designed in a very particular way to allow that addition to occur. So I have to say that the way that you've read that statement, I think, is unfortunately, and I have to assume unintentionally misleading because that is not what our understanding is, it's not what our intent was, and it was not what the actions were. The preservation of the rail corridor and an ability 
to adapt the existing bridge to accommodate rail should the opportunity arise was one of the most important principles that we dealt with as a council. Thank you. Council, um, if there are any questions specific to the bridge, then I think we may want to entertain the motion by Councillor Isaac and deal with that given our time. Councillor Isaac, would you like to introduce your motion? Sure. Uh, I'll that. Keep one for myself. So it kind of has rationale following, not as formal like whereas. that the new bridge is strong enough, the new bridge is strong enough to accommodate commuter rail in the future. Council. Just to motivate, I'll, I'll mention there is wiggle room, that we're, this is not a, indicating finality in a decision, it's directing staff, so Mr. Lai and his colleagues, to draft amendments to the project charter. And so these, I would contemplate these amendments returning to council for a final decision. I've just been given this, and I have to, just looking at it quickly, uh, looking at point three, I have to say it's simply not true. So how do I deal with a motion when I feel there are factual inaccuracies versus what your simple desire might be in terms of the future? When you talk about removing the, um, the pedestrian um, aspect of the bridge in order to accommodate rail, of course, what the plan is is that it would be removed, the rail would be installed, and that that aspect of it would be reinstalled and we've seen that work around it so I don't have a chance to go through all of these and see what other other areas where you may not have the, the facts that you would need to make this kind of a motion but that certainly raises a red flag for me the way that thank it's you. worded thank you uh, Councillor Helps isn't this notice of motion we're in GPC uh, council can either unanimously agree to hear it now or we can just put it off to Thursday's meeting okay. uh, uh, so mm -hmm. Council, given, I just realized that we have a lot of people here are actually here for the discussion. And so we can rewind and do it all again Thursday or next Thursday, or we can deal with the issue now. I guess in my mind, um, as Councillor Madoff has said, that this uh, council has committed to rail, recognizing that we have uh, received clear indication from federal governments, from provincial governments, from CRD governments. Uh, that they are not at this time nor likely in the future to ever commit to this rail. That we felt it was really important to at least maintain the rail corridor and make it something possible in the future. I do know that some people did some grinding to say, you know, uh, the cost of a future bridge, uh, the 12 million you invest today, um, you know, is basically what the projection of the cost would be in the future. But fundamentally, it is a, an understanding in, uh, that um, that is not just. Uh, the 12 million or more that you would add to the bridge now, and uh, uh, that, that was the issue in front of us. The recognition that it's another 15 million dollars just to get the rail back running. Recognition that it's 150 to 200 million dollars uh, to uh, have the union uh, built up to speed. That many of the indication that we see from the federal and provincial governments is, is there will be at some point light rail, um, and that uh, the best place for this at this time uh, is, is uh, on the Johnson. Uh, sorry, on the Douglas Street corridor. Um, so we did it, we've done our best to preserve it, but recognize that it's not something we go along. Um, certainly there was my feeling in my mind that we could put a $12 million rail bridge on this with the hopes that it might happen. Uh, I certainly saw it as a, a, a very, very high risk of a $12 million viewing platform and quickly becoming a fast ferry fiasco, um, especially when we uh, have the knowledge that uh, these, things are, these investments are not there and that we can only do it as a regional or a capital thing. So, um, I also pragmatically have to recognize that the decision was made, uh, that staff and council have to uh, proceed and, and move on with that, that it is not a wiggle, it is not a small adjustment, it's not something to go on, it is a stand of scope and change. I have to trust my staff and my engineers on that, as you said, the UI are engineers, um, and I'm not prepared to waste the, the $21 million to delay the project, um, and recognize fundamentally we asked our population about whether we should include rail or not in this. We did not put, it came down as the lowest procedure. We went to referendum 
and our population in a fully democratic process said, um, for us, a cost was more important than real. Um, so, uh, ultimately, much like the referendum in Quebec, eventually you get to say, you know, you can keep calling for the referendum, but fundamentally you've got to say, enough's enough, let us move on, uh, let's get this one done. Any other one to speak at this time on the, the motion? Councilor Young? Are we putting the motion on the table? It's on the table. It's on the table. You oh may challenge the motion's legitimacy on the table by saying not all of us agree to it, to hearing it now, in which case it'll turn into a notice of motion and we can address it at another date. So either speak to the motion or challenge it. And okay, if everyone else wants to deal with it now, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to deal with it now, I guess. Um, I, I have a lot of sympathy for the... Sorry, Councilor Matterford, you say that it's appropriate to notice a motion, so at which time we yeah, do not have a unanimous agreement. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so at this time, we uh, will take it as notice of motion. Thank you. Um, I don't know when our next uh, GPC the is. The 16th. Yeah, so we'll hear on the 16th. Uh, we'll add the agenda at that time. Thank you very much. Notice of motion. Council, is there any other uh, issues at this time? Information uh, sharing. Information sharing. This is just for us, if you like. This is just a meeting for information. This, this is information sharing. It's relevant. It's a, a gentleman wrote it to me in an email, and it is relevant to this discussion, so it's just a quick anecdote to share. Council, you will. Uh, Twilly, is it something that can be shared on the 16th? It will remain relevant at that time. Well, we'll have a number of other agendas. It's very pertinent to this discussion, which we've allotted this afternoon. Around, right? around the bridge. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, in the 1960s, my the timeline I'm not certain, but Toronto was uh, contemplating building a project called the Bloor Street Viaduct to get over the Don Valley, which is a very substantial valley, uh, wider than uh, Victoria Harbour at the Narrows where we're constructing this bridge. There was a major debate over whether at that time the viaduct would be built in such a way as to accommodate a future extension of uh, the Bloor Street subway line. And I believe at that time, Toronto Council in Toronto was a much smaller city than it is today with a smaller tax base. It made the decision to build the viaduct strong enough and a decade or more later, that subway line was actually extended. So it's just a precedent of another Canadian municipality taking a hit, perhaps a leap of faith, but making a strategic decision that it made sense to invest some additional funds in the present in order to have infrastructure that could save considerable funds in the future. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. To that point, though, doesn't it really depend on when you want to pay the premium? Because in that case, they paid a present premium on a known future initiative. What you're suggesting here is that we pay a present premium when we don't know if the ENN will be functioning. So the question is, do we pay a present premium on a gamble, or do we wait until that becomes a surety and then pay a future premium? You haven't put the economic application in properly. And I, and I think that that's it. We, we went through this discussion a number of times, and we said we want, we desperately want to see the ENN be functioning throughout the island. And we will protect the rail corridor in future, and we will allow it to line up and be part of this at some point in the future when we're sure that the rest of the, the line is in play. So I mean, that's, that's the difference between the offer, the, the anecdote you just offered. Thank you. So moved. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay. We should look that one up. Okay.